address needs to be. I have heard nothing but praise from my boy there. And I am proud as punch of you, and I thank you so much. I already delivered one fine sermon this morning. You know how hard it is to get a good sermon, much less a great sermon? Appreciate all that effort, HB. Tonight, we'll talk about the new year. The new year's not here yet, but it's getting close. <coughs> and uh, it comes next Wednesday. Problem is, when we meet on Wednesday, it's hard to start at it. So we're going to talk about the new year tonight. You know, the new year, 2020. <laughs> when I think about next year, I don't have everything laid out knowing exactly what's going to happen. And I do know I'm going to try my best, but it's so easy to lose your way when you've never been somewhere before. And I've never been into that year before, and you haven't either. As a matter of fact, I've never been into tomorrow of my life, if I'm given another day. We're about to enter new territory. We're about to step into another year, 2020. I want to look at that in a different perspective. You know, uh, usually on New Year's sermons, you hear the preachers stand up and they talk about, I'm going to lose weight this year, and all these little things we come up with. Let's look at something a little bit more important. In fact, a lot more important. This past year has really been an eventful year. We've been in weddings. We've been in funerals. We will remember those that have gone on before us. We look around us and we know our time's coming. We've learned a lot this year. We've learned how short life is. We've learned how fragile we are. We've learned through looking at other people how important it is for us to be right in God's sight. Many things have happened. Some things had happened that we're really all familiar with. There wasn't a whole lot of new things. There was some new things, but most of last year was what we're pretty well used to. But you know, whatever about last year, all the things that I did, all the things that you did, they're all recorded. Revelation 24. <coughs> we'll be judged by them. I'm going to be judged by what I did and what I didn't do. I'm going to be judged by the small things. My attitude. Maybe I physically did everything I was supposed to do. But did I do it for the right reason inside my little heart? Did I serve God for the eyes of men? But did I serve God, wanting to please God? Did I honestly try to reach out and direct some poor soul that's going to be lost and try somehow in my, my feeble way to bring him to Christ? Did I improve myself? Did I really grow in knowledge? A better question, did I study the Bible, did I pray enough, but did I grow in spirit? Am I a better man at the end of the year than I was in the beginning? Or am I still the same old guy? Do I have better traits? Have I overcome some of those things the devil was hanging on to me with? Or have I just not changed any at all? If I haven't changed, I guess... If I swim and I drown because I'm just treading water. You can't tread water forever. You've got to swim. You've got to try to get to the other side. And the other side is righteousness and that's where I want to be. And I don't want to fall into that thing that so many people fall into. I'm okay. I'm not great. I'm not perfect. But I'm alright. I don't think that'll get the job done. No. God expects more of that out of me. Yet what will happen next year may be familiar to me, may be familiar to you. You know, when I see other people facing death's door, oh, I hate it. It scares me. <coughs> well, what's it going to be like if I face death's door? What's it going to be like when I see somebody I, I know, I care about, but they're not mine, and I see them die? 
I see them get extremely ill. Well, I'm uncomfortable with all that because I care for them. But what if it's somebody like my very, very closest, my spouse or my child or my parent or my brother or my sister? What's that going to be like? We've got a lot of thinking to do. You know, folks, I guess I can say this. Whatever's done is done. There's nothing I can do about it. Not one thing. I can't change anything that I didn't do that I should have done. I can't change anything that I did do. I wish I, I hadn't done. It's all out of my control. You know what's in my control? A lot of it is in my control, and that's what's going to happen from this minute of my life on. For the rest of this time that we're together tonight. For my sermon, for our sermon out of God's Word. Is it going to affect me in the right way? Or am I going to get up and walk out of the door unchanged again? I don't know. Men look backward and they look forward. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 10. Paul. Paul thinking of his past. You know, it's easy to look at your past, but to look at my past, it's a little bit harder. He says, after Jesus Christ had already showed Himself had been resurrected to the 500, to His apostles and to others, he finally comes and he sees Paul last. And Paul says here, that last of all, he, Jesus, was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. What do you mean by that, Paul? I just don't fit, he felt like. You know, it's like a lot of people today that come to church and they look around and they see all these beautiful, wonderful, precious Christian people and they feel like, I just don't really fit here. I shouldn't even be here. I felt that way in my life before. You have to realize that what is done is done. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles, and I feel that way so many times. I'm the least of all the Christians, Lord, who am not worthy to even be called an apostle, who am not even worthy to be called a child of yours, because I persecuted the church. With us, it might be because I was an enemy of Christ. And that is so grim and so hard to accept and nobody wants to even talk about that. But as we study the Word, we come to the very next verse. I'll read it for you. Verse 10. Paul said, and this is God talking to us through the Holy Spirit as well as Paul, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. All the things that have happened in my past, good, bad, or ugly, here I am today. And His grace toward me was not in vain. Oh, how important that is, God. Lord, as I approach 2020, You have forgiven me so many times of my sins. Uh, I've read Your Word. I've studied it. I've tried to grow. I, you've blessed me in that respect. You've helped me to grow in knowledge. You've helped me to grow in spirit. And Lord, I want you to know it's not going to be in vain. I'm going to make it worth your time and your while. Starting now and for the rest of my life, I'm going to do my best to serve God. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul, a full-blown murderer, a sinner. And now by the grace of God... Here he is, what he is. A child of God. And he plainly states, but I labored more abundantly than all of them. And we can do the same thing. We don't have to take a back seat to nobody. Because you are a child of God. You got a lot to offer. You just got to do it. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me and with me. Thank you, God. Here Paul felt disassociated with the apostles. He felt disassociated even with the brotherhood. Felt like, am I really good enough? And I have felt the same way. I don't know about you. But by the grace of God, by the love of God, and by the blood of Christ, 
I stand before you a child of God and you stand before God a child of God, a Christian. We've got a lot to do next year. What do we observe about the past year? Ah, do you remember the blessings? We talked about some of the bad things. How about the blessings? If you count your many blessings and honestly name them one by one as the little cute thing about counting the sheep to go to sleep, you'll go to sleep and wake up in the morning still counting. Count every blessing. Don't just count the big ones. Don't just count the prayers that He's just answered. Try to think of all the prayers in your life that God has answered. All the times that you've been lost down and out and all of a sudden you're lifted up by the grace of God. Mm. Ephesians 5.20 Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did I enjoy the personal spiritual growth? 2 Timothy 2.15 Did I not just glance at this? No, I rightly divided it. I studied it. I wanted to know what it said. Did I learn something this year that I can glean and put into my heart and into my soul and make me a better person? Did I study enough to make myself perfect and complete in God's sight? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And did I ever miss the opportunity? And if I did, Lord, I want to do it now to confess my sins to You with a fervent heart so I can find forgiveness again. Because I can do that only as a child of God. Did I remember the missed opportunities? If I did miss any opportunities last year, Lord, I don't ever want to miss another one. If I need to make something in my life change, if I need to repent, if I need to tell a brother I'm sorry, I don't want to miss the opportunities. As I think back, did I fall away? Did I become weaker? Learning from the past, looking for the future. I want to learn from my past, but I want to look at a new me, a new man. Starting now and next year. Next year will be a new year of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen, folks. You might think you do, but none of us do. Tomorrow is not a guarantee. James 4, 13 through 15 just simply speaks of people making plans and speaking of how short life really is and everything that I've got planned for next year is only if my God wills. If He don't will me to do it, if He don't want me to do it, it won't happen. I have to have God with me and you do too. Remember the, the uh, parable in Luke 12, 16 through 21? The farmer that had all the crops. Oh, it was wonderful. He says, you know, I, I've got to build bigger barns and I'll tear those down. I've got so much, I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. Sit back. What does that represent? That represents me with all the blessings I have. Sit down and I'm not working for God anymore. I'm just enjoying it. And all these souls that are lost, all these souls that are going to split hell wide open and I don't care, the Lord looked at him and He says, uh, Fool, your soul will be required of you tonight. Oh, that's a wake-up call for me, brothers and sisters. I don't know about you. What can ruin my plans? Many things. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some things that we take for granted. Christ may return this coming year. Oh, listen. We know there's a second coming and it's going to come as a thief in the night. When it happens, does anybody here know when the thief is going to break in your house? No. Did those poor precious souls today in Texas worshiping God know that death was going to come in the door? No. And we don't either. We really don't know. The second coming will be like a thief in the night. It's going to happen. As a matter of fact, His return is guaranteed. John 14, 1 through 3. Christ, Christ promised that He would return. When we look at Matthew 25, 1 through 13, I'm going to read the first verse. 
Then the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? It's before my eyes right now. The church of Christ. The kingdom of Christ. The body of Christ. Colossians 1, 13 and 18. There you are. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like the ten virgins. And now you know the story. Five of the virgins were prepared. Five of the virgins were not prepared for Christ to come. Represented by the church being the bride and Christ being the groom. What does that mean? That means about half of the church won't make it, brothers and sisters. And you know what? I don't want to be one of them that don't make it. I hope and pray with all my heart, and I hope that you do too, that each one of us here will join hands one day in heaven because we were prepared. We may die this coming year. I don't think so. I'm too strong. I'm too healthy. I'm too... Give me a break. I could make you cry right now some stories that's happened right here in this building. It makes me nearly to cry thinking about it. Just because you've got a precious little grin on your face. Just because you look healthy. We don't know what tomorrow brings. No, this year, somebody here, me included, may die. Psalms 89, 48. What man can live and not see death? What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? He can't. Every one of us are going to... That's a reality. But we all think it's years down the road. It may not even be days down the road. Death is not a respecter of persons. We know now that the young die, that the old die, that the healthy and strong die, that the sick die. And the most sad story of all is... They're prepared, die, and go to paradise and on to heaven. And the unprepared, they die as well. And that is so sad. We may live many more years as well. What happens then? You know, Isaiah 38, 1 and 5, Hezekiah knew he was about to die. He didn't have a chance in the world. He was gone. But he prayed to God a fervent prayer with tears in his little eyes. God extended his life 15 more years. Let me ask you this. We've had some beautiful, heartfelt, fervent prayers from this pulpit by some precious, precious men of this congregation in behalf of many. And some of those people, you wouldn't have given two cents that they'd be there tomorrow. And they're still here with us today. Still alive. Some of them are here, but they're alive. You know, <coughs> what do I do with my life if I'm given many more years? Will I, will I be like I have this year, about the same person I was at the beginning of the year and now at the end of the year? If it's 20 or 30 years from now, will I have progressed as a child of God? Will I become what He wants me to in the image of His Son? Or will I still be me? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. John, this is to you. Romans 12, 11. John, preach that to the flock. This is to them. God wants us, asks us, tells us, I beseech you, I'm telling you what you need to do next year, God's saying. And that is, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And every step you make, and every word that comes out of your mouth, and every thought, and every encouraging or unencouraging word, get rid of them, I'm a brother or sister. Be acceptable to God. It is your reasonable service. Tell you what, church, this is my new year coming. I pray to God that it is yours as well. We can all grow. We can all do better. Oh, but I'm doing good. I know you're doing good. 
Everybody here is doing good. But everybody here, including me, can do so much better. Psalms 118.24 tells me when I need to start this. Next Wednesday at 12.01 in the morning, I'll be asleep, I hope. So when do I start it, preacher? This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Right now. Right now. This is a message from God to me personally and to you personally. <laughs> My plans for next year are all, if the Lord wills, we will see our dreams and goals realized. We've all got dreams. I've got dreams of this congregation. I've got dreams of so many of you. And I've got dreams of me. I've got dreams of my personal family that God has gifted me with. I've got dreams for my friends. I've got dreams. I've got goals. And only with God's help and my free will will it happen. Paul's attitude. Paul, an apostle, realized this. In 1 Corinthians 4, 19, Paul said, He would come to you shortly if the Lord wills. In 1 Corinthians 16, 7, he says, If the Lord permits, and in Acts 18, 21, Well, God willing. And yet we come up with all these definite plans of the future, forgetting the second God's given us right now. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. But I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. I see my road next year smooth as silk. I see me just going right to the top, becoming what God wants me to be. I don't know that that will happen, but that's my goal, and I'm going to strive for that. But I want to tell you something. I've learned in life, and I know everybody here can testify to this. Those roads are not smooth, are they? They're filled with holes. They're filled sometimes half the road falls off. Life is not easy. We're not promised a rose garden. But what we are promised is to get through all these hardships, and God will take care of us. Plan A. This is exactly what's going to happen to me. That sounds like me when I was 18 years old. This is what I'm going to do. This is me at 72. Well, that didn't work. I'm going to go to plan B. I'll try this. You know what has happened so many times in my life and in the lives of many? <laughs> we ourselves are often the reason our plans don't work. Sometimes we get into a routine and all of a sudden that routine becomes acceptable in my mind, in my heart, and it ought to be all right with God. But it's really not. It's just a tradition or a routine that I've got into. I'm not willing to change. Be careful there, brothers and sisters. We never, ever need to think like that, except when we're doing right. Then we don't want to be tossed to and fro by any wind or doctrine. I don't want to be the one that always points out the negative. <laughs> Next year, I want to be the one that actually says, that's a half a glass of water and it's half full, not half empty. I'd love to strive for that next year. I wish we'd all strive for that. We forget to trust in God. It is called trust, that is, a confident, positive faith. And that's the only way I can pray without doubting. When I ask my Father in Heaven to take care of something, you know what I believe? And God's listening. I believe He'll do it. It may not be the way I want it done, but oh, my Father's all-powerful. Not realizing it, we ourselves sometimes have become a stumbling block to someone else. Sometimes even to someone about their own, our own plans. We can become a stumbling block to the growth 
of the soul of someone, we can become a stumbling block to the growth of a congregation. We can become a stumbling block that someone will fall over and be lost. We have to be ever so careful. Romans 14, 13 through 23. Let us not cause a brother to fall. Let us not grieve one another. I like verse 18 and 19. When one is trying to serve God, my words, let us pursue peace. Let us take notice. This is the law of love. I want to support you. I want to encourage you. I want to uplift you. That is so important for all of us to do next year. Every one of us. Let's support, inspire. Let's push other people to the top. Let's take their ideas and mold them and help them work them out. If they're trying to work, let us help them pave the way to get that done. You know, I'm afraid if I criticize you long enough, but I've seen this to children. You ever seen one, someone criticize their children every time they do anything, every that time they say anything, no matter what it is they're being criticized? What will happen to that child eventually is you will break its spirit. It will lose its confidence. It will lose its drive. In other words, in life it quits. That happens to a child of God as well. I don't want to be part of that next year. Romans 12, 16. Let us all, church, this is the goal for us, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble and listen. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Let us trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And lean not on your own understanding, and then always acknowledge Him, God. And He shall do what? He shall direct our paths. We also need to address a thing called apathy. Hebrews 2.1. That's a snail. That's a, I clocked in, I was at church, I clocked out, I'm gone. We need to take heed to the things we learn. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that, the Holy Spirit wrote this word for me and I'm learning it and I can have all the knowledge in the world but if I don't do something with it, I'm not taking heed, am I? Hebrews 5.12 By now some should be teachers and still learning the first principles. Ephesians 5.15-17 through 17, pretty well sums it up. Let's let God say it word for word to us. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the little time that you have, because the days are evil. And if you've been looking at us, which he is, our days are evil. We don't have much time. So we need to walk with wisdom. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here's where you understand it. This is what we've got to put into our heart, our minds, and our lives. I love Luke 12, 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps keep burning. In other words, soldiers of Christ, we're ready. We'll take on the devil head to head and we will defeat him. Next year we'll stand shoulder to shoulder as soldiers in the kingdom of God and we will defeat the devil. It is time for us to stir ourselves into better service for the Lord. Romans 13, 11 through 14. He says, it is time for me to take charge of my life and my destiny. No more waiting, John. Quit talking about it. Quit thinking about it. Quit planning and do it. New year, new me. New year, new you. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Oh, that needs to be the farthest thing from us. But what is good for necessary edification? That's what I need to hear. That it may impart grace to the hearers. There is nothing better than an attaboy. There's nothing better than a I love you. There's nothing better than I call you friend and brother. 
Let us be like a Barnabas, the encourager. Let us all in 2020 be known from wall to wall, from floor to ceiling, as the Barnabas congregation, the encouraging con congregation of the Lord's church. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. More words from God to us for the new year's coming. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assemblies as, as of ourselves together as some do, but exhorting one another and so much more as the day approaches. When I come here and I'm all by myself, it's so much of a downer. When I come here and I look out and I see your little precious faces sitting where you're supposed to. <laughs> I think that's funny. Sitting where you're supposed to. It sure does light up my heart. And I know it lightens yours up too, doesn't it? My care for other souls is going to be a major part of my life next year. I want to care about the souls of mankind, both within the church and without the church. I want to be concerned about my church family, Colossians 3, 13 and 14, and to do that, God says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave. And over all these virtues, here comes that sweet, precious glue. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I hope and pray that I have just described the Antioch congregation of 2020. How am I going to do all this next year? One step at a time. That's the way I'm going to do it. There's no other way I can. I can't do it all at once. So I'm going to end this sermon with a cute little tale of somebody that is a victor one step at a time. Old farmer had a piece of property. He dug him a well. Big old well. He only had one mule. The mule fell in the well. And the old farmer looked down at that well all the way to the bottom. He saw his little old mule down there. He said, Mule, I love you. And I'm so sorry. I'm not man enough to pull you out. And the old farmer got to thinking about it. He thought, he's lost. I'm just going to bury him. Well, the old mule was created by God, and he's got a good brain. And the old mule didn't want to die. So the man says, I'm going to spare you. I'm going to bury you. I can't see you suffer. So he started throwing shovels of dirt on that old mule. And when the old mule's back would get full of dirt, he'd shake it off. And when he hit the floor, he'd step over on the dirt. And he did that all day long until finally he stepped out on level ground. I don't know that I can get all my goals done next year. I don't know that I can be the man that God wants me to be next year. I don't know that I can preach the Word, teach the Word the way He wants me to. Can I actually live a life to live up to what He expects out of me? I don't know, but I know one thing. I can start now, take it one step at a time, and go for it. And that's what I hope and pray we all do. Again tonight, God has given you, and He's given me, an opportunity as Christians to repent of anything, change anything in our life that we need to. Brothers and sisters, I would challenge you, let's all join hands and let's get together in our mind in complete unity to save each other and to save souls out from sight here with the very best heart that we can produce because God created you. And He wants you to be Christ-like. So let's don't let Him down. If you have a need, come forward as we stand and as we sing. Earth of great days coming,